First, I want to say ni hao to my Chinese classmates. Thanks for coming. And thank you to the English department and to Andrea to a for asking me to speak today about a book that really um, has meant a lot to me. If you get to know me for very long at all, you're going to hear sooner, probably rather than later, that I have been to East Africa four times, twice to Kenya and twice to Uganda. East Africa is a fascinating place. The life, the streets, there's so much going on, so much to look at. This is a market. And then, of course, that in Uganda. But there's the colors, the dancing, the music, the warm welcomes, the uh, fabric that the women wear, and children everywhere. In Uganda, 48% of the population is age 14 or younger, nearly half. And in Kenya, it's 40%. So there really are children everywhere, and they're adorable. But every time I've come home from Africa, I've just come home feeling like something isn't right. And it just rattles around inside of me. It's not right that some people, meaning us, that we have so much, and others, they have so little. This is the kitchen for one of the orphanages I visited in Kenya. That is the kitchen. Those children are going to get two meals a day. That is the first one. Seventy children are going to eat out of that one pot. And it's nice to have a house, and that family even has a couple of goats. But you know, probably none of us want to live in that house. So as I've kind of sought answers to understand the culture, to understand what's going on, I asked people I met, particularly educators, to recommend a book to me by an African author that would help me to understand the culture. And overwhelmingly, everybody said Gugi Wathiango. Gugi is from East Africa. He's a great author. He's perhaps their greatest native son author. Doris Lessing, for example, is not actually African. She was British. The Guardian in 2010 thought he should have won the Nobel Prize for Literature. The Washington Post in 2016 was like, what the heck, Bob Dylan? <laughs> and so far, <coughs> Gugi Wathiango does not have his Nobel, um, his Nobel Prize for Literature, although he does have people advocating for him. Gugi was born in Kenya in 1938. And in case you don't know where Kenya is, although you probably do, it's right there. In 1938 in Kenya, the, Kenya was a British colony. And Gugi was born into the Kikuyu tribe, and the ancestral homelands of the Kikuyu are where the British primarily settled. Those were the Tea Highlands. Gugi's family is going to experience a lot of um, mistreatment at the hands of colonial administrators. And that's going to color Gugi's experience in writing for the rest of his life. Professor Chen and I were just talking about how, to paraphrase Nietzsche, all writing is really autobiographical, and you will see that with uh, Gugi. He himself avoided the worst of it because he was so brilliant that he was able to get an education. He went to the top high school in Kenya, and then he won a scholarship to Makerere University in Kampala, Uganda, which at that time was the top university in East Africa. It was affiliated with the University of London. He thrived there. He wrote his first two novels while he was a student. No pressure students. Um, he got an <laughs> honors degree in English. And right about the time that he graduated in 1963, Kenya got his independence, its independence from Britain. There was so much joy, so much optimism, so much hope. But that was quickly going to be dashed as it became apparent that the new leaders, just because their skin color had changed, their outlooks and attitude toward governing had not. And so Gugi is going to turn into an opponent of the regime. And his writing is going to become quite activistic, trying to do something to solve those problems. Well, you just can't do that forever and ever without being noticed by a dictator. And uh, the government of Daniel Arap Moy didn't notice him. They didn't care so much when he wrote in English. But his offense was that in 1968, 1978, he wrote a play in the local language, Kikuyu, and it was produced there. It was highly critical of the government, and Daniel Eric Mori's government had had enough. They arrested him and put him into Kamiti Maximum Security Prison. Maximum security, guys, that's how important your words are when you write, how dangerous they can be. Well, he was put into prison for writing in the local language, and so he decided while he was in prison that that's what he would do for the rest of his life. 
All of his creative writing would be in Kikuyu. He wanted his grandma and his mother to be able to understand it, he said. He's continued to write his essays in English, and he's a prolific essay writer, but his creative writing is on Kikuyu. And just to show what that means, he wrote another book, his first Kikuyu book, while he was in prison, because he had a lot of time on his hands. But what he didn't have was a lot of paper. So he wrote that book on toilet paper, guys. Think about us complaining about writing on a computer. Anyway, he eventually would translate it, and it's Devil on the Cross in English. By the way, all of his novels are in our library. Feel free to check them out. Most of them are pretty thin, not like the big fat one I've done. In 1982, he uh, was forced into exile. He's been various places since 2002. He's been at UC Irvine. He is still listed on their faculty website. I just screenshot that last weekend. So even though he turns 80 this year, they still claim him, and there he is, Gugiwathiango. And on to Wizard of the Crow. Wizard of the Crow is his most recent novel. It is enormous. Uh, the book itself, they, the back of the book calls it sprawling, 760 pages. It was originally written in Gikuyu in three different volumes, so those were smaller. He himself is the translator into English. It's definitely a piece of activism. The reviewer said this is a book about choosing sides. He wants to motivate people in Africa to rise up and demand better governance. The book itself is written in the African storytelling tradition. There's quite a tradition of storytelling in Africa. Think about campfires, or I showed you the cooking fire. At night, while they're trying to get dinner together and the kids are hungry, you tell the kids stories to keep them occupied and to teach them the values of your group. But kind of what he has in mind in the storytelling tradition is going into bars, and maybe one person who is literate reads a book, or maybe the one person who owns the book can uh, read it, and everybody listens. And storytelling in bars occurs throughout this uh, book. There's one storyteller in particular, A.G., who's a policeman, who's a true believer in The Wizard of the Crow, and we are gonna hear his voice over and over periodically coming in throughout the novel. It helped me to understand that it was written in a storytelling form, because at first I was like, what the heck, this isn't a novel? Because I was expecting scene setting and description and the beautiful countryside, and you don't have a lot of that. It's almost more like reading a screenplay. Googie is also a playwright. A lot of the action is advanced through dialogue rather than through uh, description. Googie himself describes his writing style this way, with multi-narrative lines and multi-viewpoints unfolding at different times and spaces rather than focusing on a single plot from a single viewpoint. That is exactly what this book is. A lot of different multi, a uh, lot of different narrative lines, so many different characters, their lives are weaving through the tale. No one character is privileged. Even the Wizard of the Crow isn't really the main character. Um, there's just a lot of different narratives going on, different times and spaces, but the multi viewpoint really caught my attention because that is obvious in the book. He writes very short little sections, almost like vignettes, and if it's an important event, you'll hear one little from this person's view, and then the same thing from this person's view, and then this is how this person took it. It reminds me a little bit about re like reading Twitter during the Super Bowl, you know, everybody's <laughs> weighing in. Uh, maybe walking down a street in Kenya and everybody is discussing their opinions. What happened, did you hear? It's a little bit of like this book. But by stressing multi-viewpoints, Googie is actually doing, in the form of the book, what he himself is urging Africans to do. Because what he says is only one viewpoint has been allowed in their society, and that's the viewpoint of the ruler. And as long as we only allow one viewpoint, the rest of the people will suffer. And Googie is trying to encourage the people, rise up, demand that your voice be heard. And by writing in a format with multiple viewpoints, he is actually, in the form of the book, illustrating what he is asking people to do, what his goal is. Now, as far as the plot goes, like I said, there's a lot of little plots going, but sort of the overarching theme. The ruler is the ruler of the second president of a fictitious African country named Abiruria. Now, Daniel Arab Moy was also the second president, dictator, really, of the country, and everybody assumes that the ruler is modeled after him. 
He is destroying the country just because he has complete disregard for the people. Standing against him is sort of a guerrilla movement called the Movement for the Voice of the People. There again, multiple viewpoints, the voice of the people. It is headed by a very courageous young woman named Nawira and the man who loves her, the Wizard of the Crow. So yes, we do have some romance going. In the first part of the book, the ruler decides, and his kind of lackeys around him, they decide they are going to build a great monument to his honor. It is going to be the tallest building in the entire world. There's a lot of magical realism in this book. It's going to be so tall that the shadow will fall from the west coast of Africa to the east coast of Africa. It's going to outshine the pyramids. It's going to outshine the Great Wall of China. The, it's going to have a spaceship docking pad on top of it so that when the ruler wants to go explore the universe, he can do that anytime. Or he can climb up in the morning and say, good morning, God, how did you sleep? Or he can climb up at evening and say, God, how was your day? Now the ruler has, oh, he calls it a modern Tower of Babel. There's a lot of biblical allusions throughout this story. Kenya is over 80% Christian. Gugi himself rejects Christianity as the religion of the colonizer, but he's going to have so many biblical allusions in this story. And of course, those of you who know that biblical story knows things don't go well for those who try to build the power of Babel. And this, friends, is foreshadowing one of many examples in this book. But uh, the, the ruler has a problem. Of course, he has probably many problems with building this structure. But one problem is he doesn't have the money to do it. And that's where the global bank, yes, the global bank, not the world bank, comes in. He asked the global bank for a loan to build his structure. Well, about the middle of the book, eventually, the whole first part of the book is obsessed with trying to get this money. Later on then, the global bank says, oh, I don't think we're going to fund that. And so the rest of the book, a lot of it is the ruler's response. And one of his responses is he starts to blow up and expand like a balloon. In fact, there's going to be quite a number of pages where he's floating on the ceiling <laughs> like a balloon. Um, how do we respond to that? That is the, the second half of the book. So I tried to think of how did such a large book, so many themes, so many characters, how am I going to describe that today? And I decided to take three questions, sort of three questions I bring to the book, and I also think they are three questions that uh, really relate to Googie's reason for writing it. And the first question is, what's the problem? Why is there a mess? What's the nature of it? And we are going to address that question through the character of the ruler. The second question is, how did we get into this mess? What are its roots? And we'll look at a character ta called Taharika to understand that. And then finally, what is the way forward? How do we get out of here? And that's when we'll look at the Wizard of the Crow and Nawira, his lady love. So first of all, the ruler. The ruler thinks he's really a big deal. Um, you can see these quotes. Every Aboriginal child knows, I am the country, and the country is me. There is no distinction between the two of them. It reminded me a lot of being in Uganda. And when I went into classrooms and into government offices, they all had a Ugandan flag in them. I mean, you know, we expect that. But the flags were small, maybe like this and this, and they were off in a corner. But front and center, large, framed, beautiful, a picture of Museveni, the ruler or the dictator, the president of Uganda for over 30 years now. To me, it was clear where the loyalty is supposed to be, where the attention is supposed to be drawn. I am the country, and the country is me. The ruler would be pleased with that. The ruler thinks he controls everything, and he does control a lot. This uh, quote here was actually quite haunting when I read it, because who wants to be in the presence of somebody who believes that to rule means, the definition of power means, I can have you killed if I want to. You know, there's no hint of servant leader here. There's no of the people, by the people, for the people. It is just his definition of being in power, his definition of being the ruler is, I can have you killed anytime I say the word. So as an illustration of that, that I wanted to talk about his relationship with his wife, Rachel, um, little vignette that's so silly, and he's trying to show her that not only does he control her, he controls time itself. 
So Rachel and the ruler haven't had a lot of time together, and finally, it's been a couple of months since they've been alone, and finally they're going to have dinner one night. So Rachel is just all decked out and jewelry and sparkly, very pleasant, and she very pleasantly says to him over dinner, you know, I know you have a different woman every night. I understand that. I accept that. You control all women. It's true. She says, but now you're going after schoolgirls. And let's face it, you say you are the father of this country, and really, you really are. You <laughs> don't know that daughter, that girl could be your daughter. Think about the future of this country when the family tree doesn't branch. She doesn't say that, but you get the idea. He is enraged. He's enraged for two reasons. First of all, she implied that the future of the country was different than him. He is the country. The country is him. She's confused. But also, she dared to challenge him. So he is going to show Rachel, teach Rachel a lesson. He is going to stop time for her. What he does is he builds her a very nice house, surrounded by a high wall, heavily guarded fence. And inside that compound, time is frozen. The only clothes she's given are the identical clothes to what she was wearing that night at dinner. The only food she has ever served was that menu. What's on TV, what's on the radio is what was playing during dinner. The clocks tick, but they never advance beyond the minute that she questioned him. You can flip the page on the calendar, but it's always the same day, month, and year that she challenged him. All the decorations are the same. He will show her that he controls everything, including her time, and her time is frozen. That is the ruler. But you know, he really doesn't control everything. He doesn't control Rachel's tears. What he really wants is to make Rachel cry and beg for forgiveness. She refuses to do it. Go, Rachel. <laughs> he does not control the movement for the voice of the people, and we're going to hear more about them. But they are going to be a thorn in his side throughout the whole book. He doesn't control the global bank. They won't give him his money for his edifice. Western governments don't show him the honor that he feels they should. He doesn't control his own health. He can't stop himself when he's expanding and expanding. And he does not control time. In sort of a uh, foreshadowing is the story with Rachel because at the end of the book, he is going to try to show that he controls time for the entire country. And he's going to find out that, hmm, no, he doesn't. But there is somebody who pays the price when the ruler acts that way, and that somebody is the masses of the people. This is probably the quote from the book that I will remember the best. And um, it just really talks about the whole problem of Western debt. It's an example of Googie's satire because this quote is said very, very seriously, soberly to the global bank delegates by one of the ruler's ministers. So the Averillian masses are ready to forego clothes, houses, education, medicine, and even food to, in order to meet any and every condition the bank may impose on the funds it releases for marching to heaven. We swear by the children of the children of the children of the children of our children to the end of the world. Yes, we swear even by the generations that may be born after the end of the world that we shall pay back every cent of the principal along with interest on interest ad infinitum. And friends, this is what is happening in the global world, in the uh, third world. Remember when that hurricane hit Puerto Rico last summer? And instead of going in and saying, we shall rebuild, what did the US government go in? We talked about, hey, what about that debt? You already owe us so much money. How much do we have to give you? This is the problem, foregoing clothes, houses, education, all of that, because somebody somewhere has borrowed money to benefit them and not to benefit the people. Well, you can kind of see these priorities in, ha in action. This just happened at the end of January, about a week and a half ago. That was a Twitter feed out of Kenya. The, the BBC picked it up, and then I picked it up. I saw it on the BBC. There was a horrible fire in Nairobi in one of the slums. Um, the early count was four people died, although they assumed they would find more bodies. At least 6,000 people, their homes burned. Fire engines came to the fire, but they quickly ran out of water. And then there was no water to fight the fire. So the local people are trying to fight it. They were even using sewage water, it was reported. That's all they had. And the government said, well, what could we do? There was no water. 
So this Twitter uh, person pointed out this other picture because there have been a lot of protests in the streets of Nairobi recently. They have a contested election and the police have been breaking up the protesters using water cannon. And guess what? The police never, ever, ever, ever run out of water. So you can see, he says, the country's priorities. No water for people to protect their lives and their properties, but plenty of water to try to disperse people who are opposing the government. That would make the ruler proud. So how do we get into this mess? And because it's Googie, his answer is going to be colonialism. And we see that through the character Taharika and his weird disease called white ache. Taharika is actually a very insignificant character at the beginning of the book. Through the course of the book, he's going to become more and more powerful till he's really a big deal. He is a contractor who has a friend in high places, one of the ministers in the government, and he is named the chairman of the Marching to Heaven Building Committee. Never mind that they don't have money to build it. We can still have a building committee, yes? As soon as he is named chairman, two lines of people form outside his office, lines that reach forever and ever, never to see the end. One of them is a line of desperate people looking for a job. The other line are contractors trying to get a subcontract. All those contractors come in with bribes. In one afternoon, he is unimaginably rich. And the line is still going on. So he realizes as this continues, he's going to be the richest man in Africa. He goes home that night. He's so elated. He counts his money, goes into the bathroom to get ready for bed, looks in the mirror, goes into a weird trance and just starts saying, if, if only, if, if only. And then he's like taking off his clothes and getting into the bathtub and just scratching at himself. And in this trance saying, if, if only. So finally, after a few days of this, his wife takes him to the Wizard of the Crow. And the Wizard of the Crow says that he has bad words stuck in his throat that he can't say, and that's the source of his problem. And so the Wizard of the Crow helps him to actually say those bad words. And the bad words are, if only I was white. Because what he realizes is, yes, he can become the wealthiest man in Africa, but what he can never become is the one that has the respect and the power, because that is only for white people. The Wizard of the Crow calls that white ache, and you can see what the wizard says about it. And he says he's never seen anything so terrible, a black man celebrating the negation of himself. Those adorable little boys there, those are Kenyan boys um, from the orphanage I was at. And I had a conversation with one of them that was like this. This little boy came up to me, pointed at my arm and said, why is your skin that color? I said, well, my parents came from Europe. Your parents came from Africa, so you have African skin. This is European skin. African skin is beautiful. And he said, if I go to Europe, will I have skin like yours? And so I explained no and said again, African skin is beautiful. And then he said, so I can change my language, but I can't change my skin. And of course, that has stayed with me. I think that's an example of white ache. I think Googie would also point out the role of language in that, how you can try to change your language to change your identity, which is what the colonial people did by bringing in another language to sort of make their privilege their language over the tribal one. But anyway, it's a, it's a sad story. That's the, the problem. So where do we go from here? First of all, the Wizard of the Crow. The Wizard of the Crow's name is Kamiti, which is also the name of the prison that Googie was um, imprisoned in. No reviewer I read commented on that. And I'm like, hello, to me that seems really significant, so I just have to have my own opinions. This uh, smiling driver here is not Kamiti. His, it's actually Al, um, Isaac. Isaac was our driver my second trip to Uganda. He was a delight to be around, very articulate, really fun. But he and Kamiti both have the same problem. They both have bachelor's degree in business, but can't find a job. Isaac told us that the unemployment rate for people his age in Uganda is over 70%. I was actually Googling around, and I found a, a site that said it's higher than that. But that's why Isaac is fo uh, forced to just kind of catch as catch can. He does things like become the driver for a week for you know white people visiting. So that was Kamiti's problem. 
Now, in Kamiti's case, he was the only child of his parents, and they had mortgaged their future to give him an education. Sold their house, sold their plot of land. They were subsistence farmers, so now they have nothing in order to give their son that education. Now that he has it, he can't find a job. So for three years, he can't find a job, and finally he decides to just give up and go to begging. Well, the night that he's begging, he begs at the hotel where the Global Bank is visiting. And all of a sudden, there are beggars all around. They come from everywhere. It turns out that the movement for, for the voice of the people is actually all impersonating beggars to try to dramatize to the Global Bank the effect that their policies are having on the masses. So they're all impersonating. He is the actual real deal. But the police come in to disperse them, break it up. AG, our friend, starts chasing Kamiti. He somehow gets separated, and he's with one other person, which we later find out is Nawira. That's how they meet. And they end up running back to Nawira's house. Well, they're hiding in the house, and they can see AG coming down the street, knocking on every door, trying to find out who's harboring these two fugitives. So Kamiti, thinking quickly, gets a piece of paper, and on it he writes, this is the shrine of the wizard of the crow, the most powerful wizard of all who can bring a crow down from the sky. He finds a dead lizard skin, a frog, a bone, some string, ties it all together, sticks it on the sign, sticks it on the door. And when A.G. the policeman comes up and sees that sign, oh, he backs away. And they think they're saved. But here's the problem, they forget to take the sign down. And the next morning, A.G. is back, because he has a problem. He is not advancing in his career, and like so many sub-Saharan Africans, he believes that the problem must be that somebody's put a curse on him, and so he needs a witch doctor to help him out. And Kamiti has to now play the part to, you know, to not blow his cover, and guess what? After Kamiti intervenes, the very next day, A.G. is promoted to the ruler's office. He becomes a member of the ruler's private security detail. A.G. is a true believer, and he's a blabbermouth, and so we're going to hear now he's going to be spreading the word. And it kind of rattles Kamiti because what was that? Maybe he does have some power. Later he's going to say, I did not choose divination, it chose me. He figures out that actually his grandfather had been a diviner, a seer, and that he is in that lineage. Um, and so he's kind of a traditional healer, like a sealer, a seer, a healer, a diviner, or a witch doctor. Now, witch doctors, that kind of sounds like 19th century, but when I was in Uganda, it turns out they really exist. I was in the hospital with our nursing students, and there was a big sign in one of the offices that said, don't go to the witch doctor, come to the hospital. And I, I wanted a picture, but you know, I thought that would be rude. I didn't take it. But I'm like, Pff. well, my next trip there, there was a sick child that was stolen from the hospital. They actually had it on surveillance video. Everybody assumed it was the work of a witch doctor who needed body parts. And I would talk to people who would talk about the measures they went to to try to protect their children. So witch doctors are a real deal. Um, the World Health Organization estimates that 80% of people in sub-Saharan Africa will at one time or another consult a traditional healer, including a witch doctor. Kamiti is not that kind of a, he's not trying to hurt anybody just to help him, but as he starts to get into this, he realizes he starts going back to the old ways. He says, I want to hear what the animals, the plants and the hills have to tell me, and he goes off to sort of find himself. And so, um, Googi, one of his messages to us through the Wizard of the Crow is, go back to the old ways. Go back there before the colonial powers came and disrupted your culture. What you had was good. Don't forget that. But of course, everything in the old ways isn't good, especially if you're a woman. Um, you can see what some of the bad guys in the book, the advice they give. Taharika says beating his wife was his male prerogative, and he totally believes that. Wife beating is a big theme in this book. Wife beating is a theme in sub-Saharan Africa. I, uh, one of my neighbors is Kenyan, and I once went a couple of years ago to a Kenyan Christian women's event here in Kansas City. The theme of the whole event was this. This is America. He can't hit you. And they had therapists speak, they had doctors speak, they had survivors speak. It was actually quite sobering. 
Nagugi is gonna, Googie's gonna come out completely against that. What he's gonna say, not in this book, but elsewhere, he says, the old ways were in an old context. Now we're in a new context. Some of the old ways we need to leave behind, we need to bring forward what's good. So he's kind of trying to play that line. Nawira, she, she's not going to have any of this. And she represents kind of the other prong of what Googie's trying to tell us. The wizard tells us, go back to the old ways. And Nawira's going to say, fight in the streets. Stand up for your rights. She says, the silence of women in the face of male, uh, male violence is the nursemaid of more violence. She intervenes at one point to help a battered wife, but first she makes that wife promise that she will never allow, again allow herself to be hit. Nawira is a political activist. She's the leader of the movement for the voice of the people. We don't really find that out to the last five pages, but we kind of knew that all along. And so she's an activist. She believes in going into the streets. She and Kamiti fight about that for a while because he's sort of like, no, let's just go into the hills and find ourselves. And she says, we can't. If we do that, the whole group is going down. And eventually, this comes out. There's a foulness inundating our society. And if we do not do something about it, we shall all drown in it. So she's also the voice of the collective. We have to care about each other. We can't just go try to save ourselves. She's a very strong woman. And it's unusual to have a really strong woman at, uh, in an African novel. People commented on that. They said Googie's earlier female um, characters had been strong but hadn't really done anything. She is strong and she's the leader and she's the activist and she's telling us, hit the streets. Well, as things unfold, Nawira's ex-husband betrays her to the authorities. She becomes most wanted in the government. Kamiti steps in to try to help her and the way he's gonna help her hide, he says, is by hiding among the people. So they go back to her house. They reopen the shrine of the Wizard of the Crow. They start treating people. Kamiti is so good at this. He's helping so many people. And A.G., the blabbermouth, is spreading his fame everywhere. <coughs> Pretty soon, everybody in the government is going to come individually to consult the Wizard of the Crow, including the ruler. <laughs> the result is they're all going to want to kill him. But why should they treat him any differently than they treat each other? Because when you're in that kind of a governmental system and it's just all about me, well, I might need to kill you because you think it's all about you. And so there's so much dirty dealing and backstabbing and betrayal, and it goes on and on and on. By the end of the book, there is hope. There has been a regime change, but you know what? Nothing has really changed. Um, you can put a different face on it. You can even call it democracy, which they do. But it's not really democracy, what we would call that. The plight of the people is just as bad. The Wizard of the Crow is no more. The government believes they have shot him. In fact, the person who shot him, nice little touch, now we're his ex-husband. <laughs> However, they never find a body. And so the government has him burned in effigy, and then they write a book declaring him dead. Dawn. So ask yourself, is he really dead? Hmm. The movement for the voice of the people, though, is continuing to organize, and that's why there is a hint of hope. Um, Nawira says, we're trying to imagine a different future for Abiruria after people united take power from these ogres. And kind of the theme of ogres is a very African comment, and that also is a theme throughout the book. Notice the people united, but notice they're imagining a different future. And that's where it ties in, going back to the old ways, to the ways things were before the colonial powers came. We're going to take the best of that, and we together are going to have a better future. I love this picture. I call it Kenya now and then, or Kenya old and new. I think it sort of summarizes trying to go back to the old ways and bring in the best into the present. So you see the donkey train. You see the two men with the jerry can on a bicycle. And then there's the, the uh, truck. Kenya old and new. Well, what I liked about this book, I loved its focus on giving everybody a voice, on improving the life of the people. Why shouldn't governments care about little girls like these girls in Uganda? Why should they be only for themselves? Why should they be only for rich people? I loved that focus. The critique of colonialism was really, really interesting, how it destroys the culture of a people and the spirit of a people. And what he shows is that that destruction goes on and on through the generations. It doesn't just stop with the generation that first experiences it. 
There was a lot to think about there. I wondered even, and I know there's a lot of literature on uh, colonialism, probably uh, some of you are much more familiar with it than I am. It even made me wonder about what we have done with, with slavery in the US and how that has continued to c contribute to our present problems. And then I personally liked Googie's writing style. Even though it's 760 pages, I didn't feel like he wasted words. Now, my first time reading the book through, I wouldn't have said that, because it felt like digression, silly detail, what was that all about? But when I started reading it again, so I knew the perspective of how it ended, all of a sudden they were all parallel plots, there was foreshadowing, maybe one plot is the actual sort of reality, the other one is symbolic, um, plays on words, I enjoyed it. I was left with two questions, though, that I would ask Googie. First of all, where was the beauty or the vibrancy of life in East Africa? Because there is a lot of beauty. I told you that at the beginning. And I was at a national park in Uganda that was actually an, ele an elephant on the banks of the White Nile River. Where was that beauty? The young children, the enthusiasm, the dancing. Instead, the portrayal of life is just pretty grim. Of course, Googie's not trying to write for Africans to make them feel good about themselves. He's trying to write to get them to take to the streets. So that's probably part of the answer, but I missed that. And then I really thought, I wondered about writing in his tribal language. And here's the reason why. Kenya is no longer, no longer has a dictator. Now the province in Kenya are tribal in nature. And the Kikuyu people, his people, are the dominant tribe. So I have good friends who are Kikuyu, but I also have friends who are in the tribes who are out of power and can't seem to get it. And for them, they feel like there is no investment in infrastructure in their part of the country. And the reason why is because they're not Kikuyu. They feel like they can't get government jobs because those are reserved for the Kikuyu. In some ways, by writing in Kikuyu, Googie uh, seems to be privileging the ruler the new ruler's class, and that troubles me. He says, go back to the back to the past and be unified, but the past was tribal in nature. You know, the whole idea of a nation state is a colonial construction. And so now when he's trying to unify people in a colonial state, can you unify them if you're not speaking a common language? And if you go back to the past, they don't have a common language. So. It's troubling. You know, there's no easy answers. I can see why he's trying to leave behind and separate himself from the colonial past. But perhaps in the way forward, if you're really going to go forward, there isn't another option. So those were kind of my thoughts on the book. And now Googie says it's very important to get everybody's viewpoint. Um, there's going to be a big scene at the end where, lo, the entire country comes together. And the organizers of the event say, you know, even if we don't agree with you, we want to give you a chance to be heard and to speak. So I want to use this time and the rest of our time for that. You've been to Africa, you have questions, you have opinions, speak up. <laughs> Or Swahili, but Swahili is also not a, I mean, it's also not a local language. It's not a tribal language. But the two official languages of Kenya are Swahili and English. Right. So English preferable to Swahili. And that I don't know. Yeah. Either way, they're not the language of grandma and mom. But it's difficult. You know, when Googie is at the University of Nairobi, which he teaches there for 10 years, he's a lecturer in English. And here's an idea. He tries to change the name of the English department away from English, which privileges, of course, the colonial language, to change it to the Department of Literature. Because he says, why can't our focus be on Africa and its literature? So language is very, very important to him. But again, it's like important in a way that perhaps he's going to have, you know, his children can't have that same concern as he does because of the realities of life. Who else? Want to go to a witch doctor? <laughs> Want me to tell you more stories? <laughs>
Yeah, I don't have a question, but I just have to say, I could listen to you all afternoon, all day. You are an amazing presenter, storyteller. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Can I say I hate the ruler? Anyway. <laughs> I have always been associated with service work twice. I was in orphanages in western Kenya, not in Kikuyu land, but um, in the opposition lands, and uh, you saw the, the little orphan kids. And then twice I traveled with the JCCC nursing project that went to a hospital in northern Uganda, which that was interesting because that was where, um, remember Kony, Kony 2012? Yes. That was the area that he terrorized. So um, what I saw there and heard there, that just, you just take that away and don't forget that. So yeah, if I had gone just as a tourist, I would have a very different experience. Yeah, that's I'm just sure. what I'm thinking is how, how the reason that you would go to Uganda or to Kenya would be informed by you know, the actual work you're doing among people as opposed to just viewing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I've never been to any by how your experience is going to be different if you're actually working as opposed to just sort of vacation. Yeah. I'm sure if I went back, yeah. Do you think you, you go on service learning, when you go through service learning, are you serving people you're serving? Do you feel that's part of the solution to the problems in Africa? Or? That is such an interesting question. When I go to the study abroad conferences and I go to the service learning sessions, Boy, that's one thing we talk about a lot because it has to be mutually helpful. It can't just be helping them. I don't come in as the white savior. All I'm doing at that point is sort of reinforcing colonialism. But also it has to help us. You know, We're not just tourists there, it's service. And so you're walking a really fine line there. Mary Smith, who's now retired from here, led the trips I was on. I thought she did a really nice job of trying to have it be walking side by side. Our students went and shadowed nursing students, so they kind of lived their lives. It's hard to not go in sort of as the Messiah because we have so many more resources, so many more um, things we can give them. It's a hard line to walk. I came away partly concerned that sometimes we go in and we take jobs away from local people. Like if you go in and you're gonna build a building somewhere, yeah, it makes it cheaper. And we all have our great experience but maybe there's these unemployed builders in the area who sure would like to have made some money. Um, it is a problem. I almost come back feeling like part of the solution is sending money to good people, not to the governments, because they're, they're so corrupt. On the other hand, if we don't go see for ourselves, we're not as inclined to give, it doesn't touch our hearts, we don't have a bigger view of the world, we might believe America first rather than seeing our actions. So. There are no easy answers, just like there's no easy answer to language. You have to keep it all and try to keep these two disparate things together. It reminds me, I just finished reading Zadie Smith's Swing Time, Do the Great Return, which has to do precisely with this issue of charitable work and service mm -hmm. and the, the multitude of complications mm -hmm. and problems that happen as that unfolds. Uh, much different kind of viewpoint what you're doing uh, in service work. This is a rock star who decides to insert herself into a, mm. into a poor country and build a girls' school, right? Right, and the problem is if we don't go, that's not a solution either. It's right. just, it's a paradox, and you have to try to walk the line. And so Goody does a good job probably exposing those paradoxes. He writes a lot about how the West comes in. I mean, that's a theme in the book, too. And we never look good, guys. We just look good. <laughs> it's kind of sad, actually. A little embarrassed. You want to hide from them. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for coming.